Believe it or not, there was a time when stories of fascinating creatures and locations had to transition from an idea to common knowledge through old-fashioned means, such as word of mouth and publication, which makes it that much more amazing that things such as Bloody Mary, the Boogeyman, Mermaids, Bigfoot, and more found worldwide recognition. It seems completely natural, then, that the advent of the internet would not only help to rapidly spread the awareness of these classic pieces of folklore, but it would open the door for new and exciting examples of folklore to originate and spread directly from the internet community. While commonly referred to as creepypasta, a term derived from the cut-and-paste nature of internet ghost stories that interested parties can adopt and expand on from their own perspective, these creative instances, for all intents and purposes, are just a continuation of the very human practice of creating and spreading folklore. For this inaugural episode of Doom Online, where we hope to take a look at a wide array of internet content, we will take a look at my three favorite instances of internet folklore in the order that they were revealed to the world. Slenderman, the SCP Foundation, and the Backrooms. In June of 2009, the Octic Nerve Forum of the internet website community Something Awful issued a request for its users to create paranormal images through Photoshop in the hopes of stirring up new creepypasta fodder. Many people submitted ideas and images, but one pair of black and white images submitted by the user Victor Surge stood out among the rest. The first image finds a small group of despondent preteens walking down a nondescript dirt road. In the rear center of the image stands a slim, abnormally tall and faceless figure, right arm outstretched, with seemingly no visible facial details. The grainy image was accompanied with the caption, We didn't want to go. We didn't want to kill them. But its persistent silence and outstretched arms horrified and comforted us at the same time. 1983, photographer unknown, presumed dead. The second image, which is slightly more stylized, bears a prominent seal in the top right corner identifying the picture as part of the City of Sterling Library's local studies collection. It is a seemingly normal image of toddlers playing on a playground in the midst of a small public park, with at least two girls directly addressing the cameraman and smiling. In the shade of the trees dominating in the rear frame, However, it is the same abnormally tall and slim figure standing in the center of a group of children, though this time, at least six tentacles can be seen protruding from its back. The caption for this image reads, One of two recovered photographs from the Sterling City Library blaze, notable for being taken the day which 14 children vanish, and for what is referred to as the Slender Man. Deformity cited as film defects by officials. Fire at library occurred one week later. Actual photograph confiscated as evidence. 1986, photographer Mary Thomas, missing since June 13, 1986. The character, which Serge had named Slenderman, quickly became a favorite topic of discussion within the Optic Nerve Forum, and soon, other users began contributing to the rapidly growing lore via images and story expansion including present-day fictional tales and historically canonical origin stories. With this distinct look, eerie presence, and folkloric comparisons to the Boogeyman, Sleep Paralysis Shadow Man, and a host of eldritch and Lovecraftian beings, the notoriety of the Slender Man soon spread far beyond the boundaries of the Something Awful website. Perhaps the biggest turning point for the Slender Man mythos occurred roughly three weeks after the original Victor Surge post introduced the figure to the world. Something Awful member and Optic Nerve Forum user C. Gars began uploading videos to YouTube centered around himself and a fictional filmmaker friend. The videos, presented as uncovered found footage, tells the tale of the production of Marble Hornets an attempted student film which the YouTube series is named after. Over the course of nearly 100 videos, creator Troy Wagner and friends vastly expanded the lore of the Slender Man, who is largely referred to in Marble Hornets as the operator, by introducing many ideas that have become fixed lore, including the ideas of operator sickness and proxies. Marble Hornets was also connected to another channel, To the Ark, 
whose purpose was to further confound viewers in regard to the validity and madness of the story, serving as both observer and antagonist in the story to various confusing and deceptive degrees. A small handful of spin-off and inspired series followed in the wake of the success that Marble Hornets found in the internet and ARG communities. But unfortunately, none of these other content streams can match the creativity and overall mysterious nature of Marble Hornet. A failed feature film loosely connected to the series, titled Always Watching, A Marble Hornet Story, was released in 2015, much to the dismay of critics and fans. In the 2018 Screen Gems produced and Sony Pictures release and distributed big budget film Slender Man received a similarly cold reception. Of all the impact that Slender Man has had on the internet and pop culture, perhaps its longest lasting and saddest impact will be the character's controversial connection to the Waukesha, Wisconsin attack on 12 year old Peyton Lautner by our friends Anissa Wire and Morgan Geyser in the summer of 2014. According to police reports, news stories, and personal accounts, Morgan Geyser and Peyton Lautner had been friends since the age of 10. But in the weeks leading up to the stabbing, Geyser and new friend Anissa Wire found themselves deeply wrapped up in the lore of Slender Man, thanks to Wire's own fascination. Lautner took an immediate dislike in the Wire, but because she did not want to lose her friend, she stayed a part of the trio. On the evening of May 30th, 2014, Lautner and Wire were attending a sleepover for Geyser's birthday. But in actuality, Wire and Geyser were planning to enact a brutal killing they'd been planning since December of the previous year. According to Wire and Geyser's plan, they would lull Lautner to sleep after a night of partying and kill her. And afterwards, they would reconvene at a previously determined location where they felt Slender Man would accept them as his latest proxies. The girls lost their nerve that evening, but the following morning, the pair convinced Lautner to go with them to nearby David's Park to play hide-and-seek. Lautner was chosen to be it, but rather than go hide, the other two girls took advantage of her vulnerable moment and stabbed her 19 times, leaving her to die while the girls returned home. Somehow, Lautner survived despite many close calls in terms of stabbing locations, and later the same morning, she was discovered by a passing cyclist while she was attempting to crawl for help. In the wake of this event, Wire and Geyser were arrested and tried as adults for the severity of their actions, despite the fact that both girls were 12 at the time. Interrogation footage of Geyser illustrated just how disconnected from reality the two girls had become, with their calculated and detailed descriptions of her motive coming off as chilling to interrogators as they were confounding. Wire pled guilty to second-degree homicide, while Geyser accepted a plea offer that would allow her to avoid a jury trial while pleading guilty of first-degree homicide. Both girls were technically found not guilty due to mental disease or defect, and Geyser was diagnosed as schizophrenic. Wire, who immediately showed remorse for her part in the stabbing, received a sentence of 25 years to life, with part of her sentence being served in a state psychiatric institute. In 2021, Wire was released under a very specific set of stipulations and circumstances, including GPS monitoring and the inability to leave her county without permission, limited internet use under supervision and banishment from social media, court-appointed counseling with a caseworker, and a probationary living situation under the supervision of her father. Geyser, who showed no remorse for her actions, was given the maximum sentence of 40 years to life and involuntary treatment in the state institute, with pending release from the institute only allowing her to return to standard incarceration. Everything about Slender Man, short of his internet-based creation, completely fits the bill for a traditional piece of horror folklore, making him the immediate and most powerful example of how the internet can influence traditional folklore in a real way. His legend is vast and immersive, his imagery is stark and fear-inducing, and thanks to the tragedy just discussed, his impact on the real world is one connected to darkness and sadness, making any future child's fascination with him almost immediately an alarming one for involved parent. As a lover of colloquial storytelling and scaring myself silly, I found myself personally trapped in a world of wonder when YouTube creator Nightmind released a number of videos on Slenderman, 
Marble Hornets, and other connected lore. And thanks to his hours and hours of in-depth coverage and analysis, which I highly recommend for all, Slender Man has found a permanent home in my head. Unlike Slender Man, whose singular creation led to branches of lore expansion, the creation of the SCP Foundation was a singular instance that opened up countless doors of connected creation, expansion, and more, essentially making the SCP Foundation its own version of an internet extended universe. Originally birthed on the Paranormal-X forum of 4chan at some point in 2007, the SCP Foundation, whose acronym-based name stands for Secure, Contain, Protect, is a fictional foundation formed in the hopes of identifying, studying, capturing, and restraining numerous supernatural, paranormal, and other unidentifiable anomalies. SCP Files whose acronym in this case stands for Special Containment Procedures, are community-submitted and moderated, resulting in legions of academic style and personal account-based tales about the ever-growing catalog of SCPs. The files often include tales of how the SCP Mobile Task Force is able to locate, contain, and imprison different SCPs, as well as detailed accounts of researcher notes and experiments on the SCPs with convict-shaped human guinea pigs, referred to within the Foundation as D-class subjects. There are also splinter stories of different GOIs, or groups of interest, with hopes of exposing the SCP Foundation's secrecy to the masses. While the originator of the SCP Foundation is anonymous, the first SCP was SCP-173, whose foundation file describes the being as a rebar, concrete, and Krylon spray-painted animate statue. The statue will remain still once it finds itself in the direct line of sight of someone, but a blink or breaking of this line of sight in any other nature will result in an attack from the statue, generally resulting in a strangulation or a broken neck. SCPs are classified by their containment difficulty. Though the classification of an SCP does not necessarily denote or directly correlate to their danger level, these three class levels are Safe, Euclid, and Keter, with Safe indicating their simplest containment procedures, Euclid indicating containment procedures being a threat for staff if not followed correctly, hence SCP-173's classification at this level, and Keter class SCPs not only being difficult or impossible to contain, but dangerous to society at large. The range of anomalies that people have created to make up the SCP Foundation is quite impressive. SCP-3008, my introduction to the phenomenon, is a nondescript IKEA that, despite its normal exterior appearance, seems to have infinite space on the inside, a society of individuals who have found themselves trapped within and a collective of faceless humanoid creatures wearing IKEA uniforms that attack those lost within the IKEA. SCP-294 is a coffee machine found in the SCP Foundation break room that is able to disperse a styrofoam cup of nearly any liquid requested, up to and including conceptually abstract requests. SCP-096 is a creature that attempts to avoid being seen by any individual, be it in person, via a picture, or via a video, as when it is seen, it is compelled to seek out and kill the person or persons who witnessed it, no matter the victim's distance from SCP-096 or their state of protection. The list of SCPs goes on and on, giving interested parties a seemingly nearly endless well of folklore to dive into, and if so compelled, contribute to. In the 15 years of its existence, the SCP Foundation has managed to build a lengthy community of supporters and contributors online, though the idea has yet to branch out into any significant film or television project. While I do have a few concepts in my head about adapting the idea of the SCP Foundation into a television or streaming service series, the lack of this particular content does not leave interested parties starving for SCP Foundation-related media. The home of the SCP Foundation online is scp-wiki.wiki.com. And for those who prefer YouTube content, channels such as SCP Explained, 
the Exploring series, and my personal favorite, the Volgan, all have made compelling and expansive video series going into both well-known and obscure SCPs. All right, uh, that was good. I'm thinking we get a wide angle, and then we're done. Okay? All right, yeah, cool. cool. Like, how much further, like? Uh, a little more, right. a little more. You got it? Yeah, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> the final piece of internet lore we will cover today, and the most recent of the three, is the back rooms. Originated on 4chan in May of 2019, again by an anonymous user. The idea of the back rooms grew out of the internet's recently growing fascination with liminal spaces. A phenomenon defined as a place of transition, a threshold between two points, signaling the end of one time or space and the beginning of another. In Canopsia, defined as the eerie, forlorn atmosphere of a place that's usually bustling with people, but is now abandoned and quiet. Most fans of video games are familiar with instances of no clip or clip through, where a character is able to pass through a boundary into undeveloped or empty areas. And the idea of the backrooms is an attempt to manifest this legend within a real world fictional context. While the lore of the backrooms has expanded rapidly within the past year or so, the original image connected to the backrooms is a furnitureless, wall heavy room with 1970s style carpeting and wallpaper, as well as a signature element of intense fluorescent lighting that stands in stark contrast to the empty, uncanny valley feeling the image induces. Interestingly enough, many people have voiced a deep recognition of the location, though nobody has been able to provide a specific location from which the image originates, lead many people to believe that the original image was a digital creation. Outside of this foundational lore, which has been dubbed Level Zero by fans, the legend of the backrooms has expanded to include additional levels and anomalous creatures. Even though the original level, Level Zero, is rich enough on its own to constitute the entirety of the folklore, people who created at least two additional levels that have gained widespread acceptance, as well as branching sub-levels, layers, and pocket rooms. Scores and scores of different humanoid and anomalous entities have been created as well, ranging from different organic and mechanical beasts that chase people through the back rooms, down to entities that mimic recognizable objects, like windows and wallpaper. For the most part, the lore has described the back rooms as an inescapable location, though some parties have created specific exits or made up lore about clipping back into reality out of the back rooms. While the back rooms have yet to find their way into the large-scale world of commercial film and television, its impact on modern internet and pop culture is impossible to ignore. A small group of original independent and modded video games have made it into the hands of the public, including altered versions of Minecraft. Though he is probably not the first to make a song or music video involving the back rooms, commentary YouTuber Quite recently released a song loosely inspired by them with the video that finds a digitally created version of him wandering the iconic hallways while spitting iconic bar after iconic bar. In January of 2022, a YouTuber by the name of Kane Pixels released a short film titled The Back Rooms, Found Footage, that swept the YouTube community by storm, a feat made even more impressive by the fact that he was reportedly 16 at the time. The film features a small crew making a short film, when suddenly, the process is interrupted by the cameraman clipping through this reality and falling into the back rooms. Over the course of several minutes, the cameraman wanders through the varying hallways before he is ultimately attacked, seemingly disappearing as his camera clips back into reality. Kane Pixels followed up this powerful short with a series of shorts further expanding the lore of the back rooms, as well as the parties investigating it. While the back rooms has not been around very long when compared to Slenderman or the SCP Foundation, it has quickly found a place on the Mount Rushmore of internet folklore, capturing the attention of everyone from YouTube analysis content creators like Nightmind and MatPat, down to countless numbers of VTubers and infographic channels. The story is seemingly just beginning for the back rooms in terms of its cultural significance, but I would not be surprised if the back rooms are here to stay and will remain a high point of interest for both those familiar with it and those discovering it for the first time.
With so many creative people amassing the collective that is the internet, it's no surprise that compelling and immersive ideas such as Slender Man, the SCP Foundation, and the Backrooms are able to find a place in the collective consciousness beside more colloquial and traditional instances of folklore. While Slender Man seemingly had to fall on the sword of commercial adaptation failure, I can still see the SCP Foundation finding success in a Black Mirror-style series. And if there isn't some sort of major motion picture established firmly within the world of the back rooms within the next five years or so, I will be very surprised. What are some of your favorite examples of internet-originated folklore? Were you already familiar with these three, or are you just learning about them for the first time? How do you think these examples stand up to other internet lore like Dad, Ben Drown, Siren Head, and so on? Feel free to let me know or share your additional thoughts and ideas in the comment. If you appreciate the video or found it entertaining, please don't hesitate to leave a like on the video. And if you're up to continue this content adventure with me, then don't forget to subscribe to the DoomTube ATX channel. Until next time, this is Chief Doomsday signing off.